so it's okay. We lost a couple of minutes here at the beginning. So yes, thanks for the introduction. And uh, yeah, as Leonel was saying, uh, this is the original project I came to the LFD for. Uh, 3D orbital tracking is this technique that um, Enrico and his collaborators uh, developed. And this is what I'm going to be talking about, but I'm going to have a little introduction on particle tracking in general. Okay, so since uh, the beginning of time, we have been doing particle tracking for hunting, for everything. You basically track the position of something and infer the movement and predict the movement. Um, a good example is by looking at the stars. You look every night at the, at the sky and you see that everything is moving. But if you look long enough, you realize that some, some objects are moving with respect to the background. And the early Greeks already had a name for this. Our current name is planet, which is a wanderer, as in a erratic movement object. But they soon realized that it was not such, it's not a erratic movement, it's actually very predictable. So you can, by looking at over the weeks and months, you realize that, well, some objects move slower. So you immediately decide that they're further off, like Saturn and Jupiter, and some objects move, move faster, like the, the Moon, Mercury, Venus, and the Sun. Therefore, they are closer. By taking more precise measurements, i.e. like uh, noting the exact position with more precision, they realized that there was a strange movement of going back and forth. And the next model that came up was this fancy model with a clear overfitting with the known epicycles where they say, okay, the planets have to be going forward for a time. And then they kind of go back and then forward again and go back. And it was another 1500 years before 1400, we simplified the model and realized that that was only an artifact of the fact that we are not the center. It's rather that we are orbiting like the rest are. And kind of this is our current model, except for nuances, always again, thanks to better precision in the measurements. Uh, this very particular guy, the Danish uh, Tycho Brahe, he did very precise measurements and said, this uh, circular model cannot be correct. There has to be some combination of motions. And he put Earth at the center, Moon around us, and then so uh, Sun going around us with all the plants around the Sun. And his employee, uh, Kepler, said, no, your measurements are good, but there's a simpler way to explain this, which is our current model, the elliptical um, orbits of the planets. OK, so going from the very um, the large scale of the solar system down to the quantum world is another example. Uh, this is a picture taken with what was called the bubble chamber, which was one of the early um, devices to, to image the smashing of particles under electrical and magnetic fields. And this allowed to, in this case, quantify well the charge of the particles by the, the rotation under the electrical fields and visualizing the de decays of, of elementary particles. Uh, Alvarez was given the Nobel Prize for de um, developing this, this device. And now going into biology, our own interest. Well, uh, basically, we also have an interest in uh, tracking objects because tracking objects will give us information about what is going on, how they move, why they move, they will, and studying the types of movement can allow us to understand the, the surrounding of the, of the objects we are tracking. Uh, basically, in biology, in life, science, life sciences, everything is moving. So we may have an interest in uh, basically tracking everything that we can see. There are a bunch of examples, like uh, the biophysics of, of membrane um, lipids, the um, tracking viruses. Uh, this is an example from the LFD, um, transcription uh, kinetics of DNA. But there you can, anything that you can think of, there, has, there can be an interest in tracking those objects and studying the motion. So what devices do we have for tracking objects in biology? Well, the first one that you will think of is taking a snapshot, looking at the objects you see, taking another snapshot, another picture, camera based, and so on. So you get a sequence of images and track the objects in, in time. So we kind of put this in the middle of our, our uh, 3D uh, 
uh, graph where you, we quantify how fast we can acquire each temporal um, frame or each temporal location, so the speed. How big is the range at which we can follow our objects, so the spatial range, x, y in this case, and as we separate from the z, which is color coded in, with the color, because it's kind of a different field. No? So for example, camera based, well, we obviously don't have any sp spatial range. Um, 4D confocal imaging would be using a confocal instrument in which you're scanning in the XY and then scan another plane and scan another plane in the Z direction. This is very cumbersome. That's why it's so low in the speed axis, but it has a higher Z uh, range. Uh, I will mention also, well, optical tra 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 trapping, I won't even go into. This is a, a technique that has, is still used to measure forces at a very small scale. You can trap objects uh, with photons and you could use it for tracking, but it, it has a very, very low spatial range, so it's not really used for tracking. Um, and the one technique that uh, is our baby, should we say, is orbital tracking, which as as you can see, we put it at the very top of every range because that is what we are trying to sell. And I will try to convince you that this is a very good technique for tracking objects in space with a very wide range. And you also have a very high speed in the, in the measurements of the location of, the, of your object in time. Okay, so what does tracking exactly mean? Well, it's basically two things. One is to localize your object precisely in space and to be able to do that in successive moments in time. I mean, the, the idea is very simple. But there are many details behind this. So, uh, the, yeah, the first idea we all have is, as we said a moment ago, you take a picture. This is an example of uh, mitochondria crawling down, up and down a uh, uh, neural axon. So you have a field of view here and you see the mitochondria and this is successive fields of view. This is the same field of view, successive frames. So there's a bunch of different techniques for uh, digital tracking of offline images. So you have your sequence of images and there's basically two families. The one that is first detect your objects and then try to uh, map the locations from one temporal frame to the next. And then this is like the inverse, which is kind of a more uh, like a, uh, it's what they call track before segment. But anyway, the, the idea that everyone has in mind is segment before, so detect what objects are of our interest. And then the tricky part is assigning each one in one temporal frame to itself in the next temporal frame. So, and here's where there's a many, many techniques to do this. So if you eventually manage to identify all of them, which is which in successive frames, then is when you realize that which is the ones that are moving, which are the ones that are not. And that is how you obtain trajectories in the 3D space, in 3D spaces and X, Y, T in this case. But of course, this is, we're taking a bunch of images in time and we're imaging the whole field of view just to obtain the trajectories of a very few elements in this. So or there's a bunch of dark background pixels that are useless in our measurement of the trajectories. I'll go back to that later. So how, how, how do we measure the precision by which we localize each object? So uh, before I was talking about uh, looking at the stars and probably drawing the position on the sand. In this case, our measurement is a measurement device is a pixel-based digital image. And since we're using optical um, instrumentation, we are limited for starters by the diffraction limit. So you've all probably been hearing about the diffraction limit in this during this week. Just as a reminder, it's the expression, this is a, a simplification of the actual expression, but it's kind of a good approximation in which you're only taking into account the wavelength of the light you're using to shine your object and the numerical aperture of your system. For our instrument using visible light, typically we are talking of a diffraction limit in the range of a quarter of a micron, 250 nanometers, meaning that that is the smaller distance that we can resolve an object in our images. 
Another way of looking at it is to say anything that is smaller than that will appear as an object of that size. So anything that is smaller, like in this case of an nanometer scale, you will see it as an object as big as 250 nanometers. So that is an, a, a limitation that we have. Anything you, you would say, okay, so there is no way you can localize any object smaller than a 250 nanometers. But that is not really the case because if your pixel size is smaller than that, you say, okay, I have a few photons on the edge of this object, a few photons down here, many photons in the middle. You do the, the mean position of all the photons you're collecting and basically it'll map to a location somewhere in the middle here, which is between two pixels. So you can have a sub-pixel precision as long as you have enough photons. So that is why the number of photons is the most important thing when determining the location of an object. How do we decide, um, how do we measure, um, quantify the precision? Use the variance of the object. Imagine all the photons are physically coming from a tiny punctual uh, uh, point in space and you're obtaining this diffuse object. So the bigger the object, the worse is your, is your localization precision. So what you measure is the variance or sigma squared of the blob that you are imaging. You, ideally, this is as, as small as possible. If this is, were down to zero, you have an infinite precision. So that's why the number of photons is in the denominator. That is the, the one most important factor. Then the diffraction limiter is on the numerator, and the diffraction lim uh, limit also um, is compensated by your pixel size. Because, of course, if your diffraction limit is two, uh, a quarter of a micron, but your pixel size is one micron, then you, your, your pixel size is destroying that diffraction limit and or, or multiplying it by four in this case. So you need your pixel to be slightly smaller than the diffraction limit. At the same time, you don't want it to be too small because then you're spreading out your photons and across many, many pixels and you're losing the, the weighted average. So that's why the pixel size is also included down, up in, down here, sorry, yeah. And finally also, you want your object to stand out from a background. So the photons that come from other sources that is not the object that you're trying to, to track, you want said to be not, not too many photons coming from the background. So that is another thing to take into account. Okay, now what are the typical measurements we do with tracking? Uh, so once you have a trajectory, what, what is a, uh, a good way of getting relevant information out, out of that uh, trajectory? Well, the typical that people use is the mean square displacement. And I'll tell you now why is that the case. So suppose that you have an object that is moving randomly and at time zero, it's in a given position. The probability distribution function of finding it in space and time, it turns out is you can model it by a, a Gaussian function. So as you give it more time, the probability of finding it further and further away kind of increases. And at the same time, the probability of finding it in the original step decreases. Um, this the whatever time you measure it, the mean position of 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 your part of the whole um, probability distribution function will still be zero. A way of thinking of that is instead of one object, think of it as you have many many objects in the middle here, and then you give them time to spread out. So if at ever whatever time you measure the positions of all of them and find the mean, it will still be the, the origin. The way you quantify the spread in time is again the variance of this Gaussian the spatial variance, so the, the denominator of the exponent of the exponential. And that is, that is what is telling how wide your, your Gaussian function is. And as you can see, the coefficient in front of the, so this is linear with time started, which is the important fact, and the coefficient is the diffusion of your objects. So the fact that the variance or the square of the uh, standard deviation depends linearly with time means that the square of the movement is a linear, if the movement is random, is a straight line in as a function of time. So if you're talking about random diffusion, you would expect that the mean square displacement is a straight line. 
but if your object is actually moving because there is some directed or as we call it active transport so there is a preference to move in a direction you will see a divergence from this straight line so just measuring this quantity already can tell you a lot of information of what's going on if in in the motion of the part of the of the particle you're tracking the opposite of that is if there is something that is um there's some 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 kind of motion against a particular direction you will see this kind of um moving away from the from the linearity so with a exponent less than one and if the object is limited in space you will see that it reaches a a, a, a particular um, spatial um threshold and it will not survive that you can also see funny objects like this a situation like this in which you have some confinement and then it back it eventually releases okay so here are some more examples in biology there's an old example from the 80s and a more modern um case but it's basically the same you're imaging you get taking images in time and you're finding a way to assign objects from one image to the next now as i said before you if you are taking so many images and you're only tracking particular objects you're actually wasting quite a lot of time in in um taking the images of all those pixels that are actually background so here's a, a kind of a technique developed here in the lab that takes that into account and says okay you have your object what, what you can do is just scan some frames above and below around a very small range and if you see it kind of moving on a in a feedback looping you just simply scan towards the object so that you're kind of tracking it in 3d but without actually imaging the whole of your volume of your sample just imaging a very localized space around your object in this case three to six stack planes so the issue with the 3d imaging you can choose to make um frames above and below your object and that will allow you to track your object in time is what we were, we were mentioning but this is very limited in temporal resolution but of course you do have a complete picture of what's going on in the surrounds of, of your object there is another technique that uh, we that is an interesting to see that is you to use the defocus of the particle to infer the actual z position so in this case for example when the object is above or below it appears bigger and more spread out because it's out of focus it's out of sight of your focal plane and there's even very fancy ways to even distinguish if it's above or below just by inducing some um, aberrations in the system so astigmatism for example is an aberration that will depend on the position above or below it will kind of spread out in one direction if it's above and in the opposite direction if it's below limitation to this obviously the z resolution the psf of your object determines how as, as soon as it's further than a couple of microns away it simply disappears so you lose you you only have a very very narrow z um, resolution the final approach which is what orbital tracking is based on is kind of not imaging anything only imaging very closely around your object and tracking it in time it's what we call riding the particle so this gives very high spatial and time resolution with the drawback that you do not have images to compare to so it's hard to tell if you're actually tracking your object or you kind of lost in space so orbital tracking orbital tracking is based on shining your laser very close to the particle but not exactly on top of your particle of interest and that is because if you shine it kind of with the edge of your psf you it's where you have the maximum variability so your maximum sensitivity to a small movement of your of your object this is an image of uh, psf the the diffraction limited object you shine your focus your light into space and your focus is not infinitely small it has a certain size as we said quarter of a micron approximately and the intensity so the number of photons in the xy direction is modeled by a gaussian so it's brightest at the middle at the exact middle and as you move away you can you get less and less photons and eventually you get none so notice that the place where the derivative is maximum is exactly the place where if you are shining your object your fluorescent object with the edge of your psf and the object suddenly moves slightly away you get a a very high a decrease in number of counts and if your object moves slightly to the 
to in, towards the inside of the PSF, and when it's in the edge, suddenly you get a lot of counts. So the the, the orbital tracking technique ex exploits this by following the object, going around the object, and only shining with the edge of the PSF, which is where you have the maximum sensitivity in the number of of photons that you're going to receive. So. The idea is you have your object in the in some location. Suppose the object is in the middle of this Cartesian um, plane, and you have your PSF. You're shining all your all this blob of 250 nanometers uh, radius, and you move it around your object, always keeping your PSF at the at the at the edge of where the object is. If the object is static and you're perfectly around it, the intensity you would expect to receive from your fluorescent particle is constant because it's always at the same distance and the, regardless of the angle at which you're at, you would see a constant intensity. Here are three examples of three particles, the red, the green, and the blue, which are not at the center of your orbit. So for example, the green and the red are at the same angular position of your orbit so that when your, your PSF is around this area, you get a maximum in intensity. And as you move away, you get less and less intensity to go back to getting high intensity again in the next orbit. Another example is the blue particle here, which is at a different angle, therefore your peak intensity is a different location. And the height of the intensity is equivalent to the green because it is at the same radius. So it, there's a moment where the object is closer to the center of your PSF, you're shining it with more photons. So the idea behind orbital tracking is none other than this. Um, do orbits around your object, infer where the object is in your, within your orbit by the shape of the intensity profile you're obtaining, and then move the next orbit to recenter around your object, and that is how we track our object. How do we do this movement? How do we do these circles around the the particle? Well, we exploit one of the what well, we exploit the the microscopes that are based on scanning um, on the scanning technique. So it's a it's a microscope that is usually um, used to raster scan and form images in the typical way you would form images you have two little mirrors with two motors at orthogonal directions you send a voltage to each motor in this case you send a voltage that is a jagged um, profile to the x which forms the horizontal line so it scans you it sends your laser across the sample in the horizontal way and you reach to a point where then you suddenly give it a jump in the Y to go down to the next position. The X goes to the origin and you do the next line and the next line and the next line and so on. This is how you form your image in normal scanning confocal microscopy. In our case, what we send to the scanners is a couple of sinusoidal functions which are shifted 90 degrees one another. And as you know, a sine function and a cosine function summed up give you basically a circular motion. So we can move these two mirrors so that we do circular orbits with the PSF around a point. And if we manage to do it around an object that is bright, and we can then use a feedback um, algorithm to update the location of the new orbit, that is simply shift the voltage up and down. So instead of in this range, maybe shift it up to move to the left, shift it down to move to the right, and so on. And that is how we can move the orbits in space. In the XY space, that is because the, all of this is confined to the XY space. Okay, now there's a little mathematical interlude here about the Fourier series, because we're gonna use that to, to extract the, the position of the peak and the phase of the, of the peak. So you know that the Fourier series is a series which um, is composed of successive sign and, this, is, this should be a sign here, this is wrong. <laughs> sine and cosine functions with higher and higher harmonics. Each harmonic captures information of lower frequency or higher frequency. There's a theorem that says that any function can be expressed as a Fourier series if you give it enough harmonics. So any shape, even like in this case, a square shape is, tr is being tried to um, model by a sum of n harmonics. If you do just one, well, you basically get a sine function, but as you put more and more and more, you can gradually get closer to whatever shape you're um, trying to describe. Here's another example. Just by using one, you just have one sine function. 
as you add more and more, you, you, you're adding more detail into your function. Here's another fancy example. You can basically draw anything out of um, enough uh, terms of your harmonic series. Here we see the same, the same drawing only with five, five terms of the series instead of probably like hundreds in the other one. Now, why am I saying all of this? Well, because we have this algorithm, the fast Fourier transform algorithm that is very, very fast. And we exploit the fact that this algorithm is very, very fast. And we, to, to obtain the coefficients of the Fourier transform of our profile of the intensity throughout the orbits to find out the position of the peak and the, in the phase and the, and the height. Because, I mean, if I give you this, this profile, you would say, okay, well, let's find the position, just, just simply maybe smooth it enough to get rid of the noise, um, do the derivative, find the derivative is uh, zero, find a second derivative to ensure that it's a maximum and not a minimum, and so on. But this is much slower compared to simply feeding this profile to the FFT algorithm and obtaining the coefficients of the series. So the way we, um, the quantities we extract from the intensity profile throughout an orbit are the first two terms of the series. This is what we call the DC, so the constant term, the term of uh, zero frequency, which is basically the mean of your, of your intensity profile, DC. And the AC, which is the, mod, um, the squared sum of the two terms of first order. Why first order? Well, because typically if you, if you have a single object and you're going around it, you will see a single bump. In this case, the bump corresponds to the object being closer to your PSF at this angle in the orbit. If it's to the left, it means that it's in another angle. No? So when you model this by a sine or cosine function, in this case, the term A would be um, high because it's, sorry, no, low, sine of zero, zero. So this, this could be modeled easily with a sine function. So B would be high. A would be low. In any case, the combination of these two gives us what the AC, which is basically the information of where is the peak in this, the first harmonic of the, so ob objects that happen once in our pro intensity profile. And the coefficient, sorry, the uh, quotient or the ratio between these two quantities is what we call the modulation. So the modulation, as I'll show you later, gives you information of the radial position as opposed to if the object was at the center the as i said the intensity should be constant the other quantity that is important is the phase which is relatively easy because it's simply the arc tangent of the ratio between the b and the a so it's the as i said if, if the sine is winning over the cosine it means that the the maximum is occurring at a particular angle and if for example the peak was at the very beginning a would be very high b would be low because the cosine is closer to the fun actual function. So yeah, the modulation gives you information of where in your orbit uh, the object is. If your object is exactly in the center of the orbit, your intensity is basically constant. If your object starts to move to one direction, you start to see a peak when you're scanning in this region where your object, the object is moving towards. And as it moves closer and closer, the peak goes higher and the intensity goes lower in the other ends of the orbit. But as, as the object leaves your orbit and moves away from it, you basically start to get zero intensity. The modulation, therefore, it's the, being the ratio of these two quantities, you can use the modulation to find out where within your orbit is. And this is very important because it means that it's okay, you're orbiting around your object and updating every orbit but you actually know the position of your, the object at every point in your orbit. So the scanners that we use, typically you can do orbits in the millisecond scale, one, one orbit every millisecond, but each point in the orbit is actually in the microsecond scale. So you will have localization of your object, temporal localization in the microsecond scale. Okay. Yeah, this is uh, basically what I was saying here. So the, for one thing, the, there is a region of, at which you have the maximum sensitivity and you see how, how the 
the modulation changes with with the yeah, the the precision. Sorry, yeah, because the the other thing is, what is our precision in in space? I'm saying that our localization precision in in time is in the order of the microsecond, if you're considering every point in the orbit. And again, even if the orbit's size is approximately 100 nanometers or 250. The, the precision in space is, or there's a fraction of that because you're getting many measurements throughout the orbit. So the actual precision in, in space is around the, the nanometer, in fact. Okay. Now, we have, I haven't mentioned anything about 3D. How do, you, how do you track an object in 3D? Because all we did was scan orbits in 2D, and if it moves away from your center of your orbit, you simply update the position of the next orbit. In order to scan objects in 3D, what we do is do an orbit above and below our object. So you're not doing a single orbit around your object. You're actually doing two orbits. It's more like an eight. You, you have one orbit below, and then you move to the top, and then down, and up, and down, and up. So instead of two circles, it's, I mean, this is a continuous space. So you're doing, it's a loop going up and down, up and down. So what we do is change the position of the focal plane, of the confocal plane of the microscope. And for example, if you do an orbit above and you have uh, some intensity and you do the orbit below and the intensity is much lower, you immediately know that your object is closer to the top. So we have a, another modulation, which is the ratio between the intensity up and down, so the difference over the sum. And this tells you immediately if your object is moving up or down. So you can update also in the, in the Z direction. How do you focus up and down in the Z direction? We have basically two ways of doing that. One is with a piezo mount for the objective. Your objective would be screwed onto the piezo mount. And as you can see, there's a little gap here. There's a crystal inside that you can tune. It's, a, it's based on the piezoelectric effect. So you, a voltage applied to it will contract it. So you send a constant voltage at a particular, so that the size of the gap is a particular size. and a variation in that voltage will change the, the size. The other option is to use electrical tunable lenses, which are lenses that you can, again, send a voltage and change the, the effective uh, uh, focal point of the plane. So instead of moving your objective up and down, what you do is attach your objective here. Again, you have a screw here, you put your objective on top of this, and you're adding an extra lens, which slightly changes the, the the orientation of the photons that are arriving, therefore changing the focus up of the objective. So in one case, you move up and down the whole objective, and the other case, you change the focus of the objective. Um, this, the electrical tunable lens is much faster in terms of how quick, because there's no mechanical movement, you can simply, so here's the comparison, the, the electrical lens in red and the piezo in, in blue. As we change the voltage up and down, there's, you can see there's a sharp edge is basically a square function, whereas the other one is more sinusoidal. So you can have faster changes in, in Z direction. Um, limitation is that you can't really change that much. Uh, you don't have this bigger Z range, whereas you have much wider Z range here. And the other big limitation is that uh, you're adding an extra optical element to your, to your system. So you have, you're reducing even more the number of photons that are coming to your system, from to your detector. So the, the, the less lenses you have in the system, the best. And there's another limitation on the piezo mount that I'll be mention later. Okay, so this is the basic idea behind our, our orbital tracking system. You have a confocal microscope. Typically, you have a laser shining onto scanning mirrors. You focus. Uh, you have a dichroic mirror that sends your light onto the sample, and then you collect the fluorescence on your detector. The difference is that in this case, the scanning mirrors, instead of driving them doing the the raster imaging, doing the XY normal squared um, grid, you're doing circles around your object, and also you have your nano, uh, sorry, the the well, yeah, the piezo or the electrical tunable lens that you are driving from your computer to, to change the position in, in Z up and down. Um, and the feedback tracking algorithm is well, you, what you in, in already imagine. You have, you're doing orbits around your object. Your object moves. You, de you detect that because you're tracking the intensity throughout your uh, as you do the orbits around it. And 
once you know in which direction you have to move your, your orbit, you shift towards the new position and so on. So this is the, basically the same idea. You have your position of the scanner, you obtain your intensity profile, you deduce where your, your particle is within your orbit and then update the scanner position. With the Fourier transform step here, which is the step, as we were saying before, how to, how to know where the particle position is relative to your pro intensive profile. There is a, an, an extra step that is, suppose for some reason you lose your, your particle. So if the intensity is lower than a certain threshold, what we do is you, is to increase the orbit to try and find it if it is escaped your movement. Maybe it's moving too fast, maybe for some reason you lost it, whatever reason. So there is kind of a, you try to catch it. Now this is the actual software that we use. This is, this is the SimFCS written by Enrico. And this is the software that not only uses, is used for imaging, but it's also used to drive the scanner. So it basically does everything from the acquisition and driving the microscope to the image processing and, and the, all the correlation techniques that you've been hearing about and, and uh, lifetime um, uh, phaser analysis and so on. This is the window that we use for particle tracking, where you have all these uh, different um, parameters to tune. You have a little window that shows you, you can do a, let's say you do a raster scan, just a normal scan. You see your image and you say, okay, this is the object I'm interested in tracking. Then you tell it to, whoops, go back, to go to that position. And these parameters here will determine, well, the size of the, your orbit, so the radius of the orbit, the number, so the time it, the laser will spend in each point in the orbit, how many points are in the orbit, you can do how many orbits you want to do before updating the position. You may want to do several because maybe your object is very dim or for many other reasons. Um, sorry, I was saying the number of points per orbit, the period of the orbit in milliseconds, microseconds in this case, and basically a bunch of other parameters. There should be another one, which is that the distance between um, orbits in the Z directions and so on. And as you're tracking this in real time, you will in, in real um, space, time and space, you will see how it's moving and you would see a trajectory in the 3D space here. This window here would show you the, the actual intensity profile throughout the orbit. This is 128 because we have 128 points in an orbit down here. So you would see at the beginning a certain bulb and as the object locks in, the, the orbit locks in the object, you would see a constant trajectory throughout the, as the object is being moved up and down. Okay, and some of the unique features of, of this technique. Well, for starters, that nothing um, prevents you from tracking multiple particles. You can do, say, an orbit around an, uh, one particle, then move to the other one, do an orbit, to go back and track several at the same time at the cost of yeah, lo losing half the temporal resolution. But you, you can do it. You can combine it with super resolution, which is what Leonor was saying. The instrument we have here is a STED microscope, so we, you can do orbital tracking under uh, super resolution. Are we close to time, Leonel? So you can do lifetime imaging at the same time because the device is also a lifetime detector, and you can do a bunch of other techniques that you've heard about here, like correlation analysis. By correlation, you've heard about line scans. You do a Typically a line scan is you do a line scan and then you put the next line scan in time. This is a circular line scan. You can do what we call the carpet image. So you get the intensity profile in each orbit and have them in, in time. And you can use these orbits, these carpets to do uh, correlation analysis and infer, infer um, uh, properties of the surrounding space. You can also measure the, sh the shape because if your object is not perfectly circular, you will detect it as a double peak and so on. So you can use the high harmonics of your Fourier transform to extract information of the shape of your object. And talking about the shape, if your object is very big, instead of going around it, you can maybe do kind of a petal motion going in and out and detecting where this is your PSF, this is your object that has a certain size, and you go in and out and kind of make a map of the actual shape of the object in 3D and extract meaningful information of the of your of the structure of whatever you're tracking. So instead of doing particle tracking of a particular object, you're kind of getting information of the the shape. As I said, super resolution. This is an orbit intensity for regular confocal and under stead uh, microscopy. 
it becomes much narrower. You can, because the PSF is much narrower, you can do smaller objects. So you increase not only in temporal, not only in spatial, but also in, in temporal resolution. Limitations, I have mentioned one already. The first one we will know is photo bleaching. So you can't really track forever because eventually your, your fluorescent particles will bleach out. You'd say, well, you're, you're, for one thing, you're hitting your object with the edge of the PSF, so you're not shining with all the photons, but that is true, but you're also hitting it all the time. When you do regular imaging, you only go by over your object once, and then you go to the bottom and start again. So the amount of photons that they receive is quite a lot. The other limitation is that the, the PSO mount cannot be used with oil objectives because the, the objective is, a, is coupled to your sample. So if you're moving up and down your objective, you're basically moving your sample as well. This is a measurement taken in which this was happening. So you have to have air, uh, air objectives. You, have, you need a gap between the, the objective and the, and the sample. And the other limitation is you can't have very crowded environments because basically it all becomes a mess. How are we on time, uh, Lionel? We are more or less in time. Shall I mention these applications? It's three slides. Yeah. So we have uh, three examples of applications. Um, in which we use orbital tracking. This is a study that was done by members of our lab. I think you're getting a talk by Francesco later on, um, in which he was uh, tracking the nuclear pore. This is the, the nuclear envelope. This is inside the, nuclear, the nucleus of the cell, and this is the cytoplasm. And he's tracking a nuclear pore in time while he's, um, he has basically uh, the importines uh, tagged with a uh, GFP, sorry, no, then, yeah, with, sorry, uh, GFP fluorescent uh, protein. And by tracking the pore in time, you can see using for, uh, correlation techniques, you can ev eventually capture the movement of the importines going, shuttling stuff into the uh, nucleus and out of the uh, nucleus. You see kind of the, the correlation from at some time, you eventually see the, the importine coming back. So there is a particular time, characteristic time, at which that takes the importines to go in and then shuttle out again. Here's another study that uh, we use the same technique. This is regarding measuring the tension of collagen fibers. So the, the samples were had collagen fibers attached to the bottom of the sample, and they were kind of floating up into the, into the Z direction. And by doing orbital tracking around different sections, so this is a particular section of a particular collagen fiber and up as you move to a different Z plane, it's the same guys here. And we were doing orbital tracking of the same collagen fiber at different heights to see how there was a uh, confinement in a different, different confinement at different heights, therefore extracting the amplitude of the vibration and also the temporal characteristics of the vibration. And the final application I wanted to show is regarding uh, budding of HIV virus. So these, these are uh, virus-like particles on the surface of a membrane. We're seeing the, <clears throat> the membrane of the cell from on top. And by doing orbital tracking on the virus, when it's still attached to the membrane and it starts to bud out, uh, this was orbital tracking done in two channels at the same time. So you're acquiring information in two separate channels. One is the red fluorescence, the other is the green. In this case, the, the green is the, the actual orbital tracking feedback algorithm is using the green. And the red is uh, the fluorescent signal that is attached to the, um, the proteins that are involved in doing the actual budding off the surface of the membrane. So that when there's a peak in the intensity or in the red channel, indicates the moment at which your object, your uh, virus-like particle starts to drift off. It's the moment it's been detached from the membrane. And you can clearly see this by mapping the, the, the temporal moment of your peak in the signal on the red channel to the moment where the diffusion starts to grow fast and fast. Here you, you see the actual trajectory. This is the moment approximately here where it starts to move away from the membrane. And that's it. Please, thanks for your attention and 